We are going to go ahead and get started with our next session, which is Why Religious Freedom Matters to Me. And this is wonderful because it steps out of some of our scholarly and academic presentations and goes into personal narrative. I loved Elder Clayton's remarks yesterday when he talked about religion being part of one's marrow. And then, to back that up, he didn't open scriptures, he didn't make doctrinal points, he told stories from his family. So I am looking forward to these stories. We're going to start by hearing from Dr. Jacqueline Rivers, who is the Executive Director and Senior Fellow for Social Science and Policy of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. She's also a lecturer at Harvard University and is presented at institutions like Princeton, Notre Dame, UPenn, the American Enterprise Institute, the Vatican, and the United Nations. She has a PhD from Harvard, and here's the fact I want to say, tell me more. She's been an elder in the Azusa Christian Community Church in Boston for more than 20 years. Her husband, the Reverend Eugene Rivers, is a revered activity and political activist and is co-founder of the Boston Ten Point Coalition. He has experience with gangs and has been one of the most effective crusaders against gang violence, founding the Ella J. Maker House, which provides mentoring and educational and job readiness and training for high-risk youth. The Ten Point Coalition played a key role in the dramatic reduction of violence in, the, in Boston of the 1990s. He's educated, he was educated at Harvard and is an, a consultant to uh, uh, interesting groups. Chile, Brazil, Canada, Ireland, and England has spoken in Zimbabwe and is a political analyst for MSNBC. Dr. Rivers. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm very honored to have been asked to speak. I want to thank John Taylor uh, of the Interfaith Council for uh, inviting my husband and me. And I'm really grateful to Brigham Young University for their commitment to religious freedom, and especially to our hosts, Brett Scharfs and Elizabeth Clark. Thank you for doing this annual freedom, religious freedom annual review. We're really grateful that you are addressing this very important issue. And in fact, we're glad for all that the church does, the Church of Latter-day Saints does on the issue of religious freedom. You have been supporters of our work in this area for years, and we thank you for your help and for your collaboration. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what I see religious freedom as being. And for me, it is first and foremost a God-given right and responsibility. It's a right to worship privately and collectively, to respond to God's calling on our lives, to respond to that inner voice that every person has, whether we choose to respond to it or not, it is a freedom to do that. And it is the right to live in a manner that's consistent with our religious convictions whether that is in how we raise our children or to speak in the public square. The right to raise, to promote, to implement religion in the public square. That's religious freedom. It's not an untrammeled right because like all other rights, we have to balance the rights of other people as we exercise ours. But it's really important that we have the right to do this in the public square. And it means that religious devotion, whether in the form of faith or of practice, it means nothing if an individual is not free to respond to God's call on her life and to respond differently as that call evolves over time and that there should be no price attached to expressing our religious convictions or for changing those convictions. I want to give my thanks to the elders, not elders, to some of the members of the LDS Church, some of the leaders in the church, for a wonderful conversation that we just had. 
I raised the question of what happens to an LDS student who comes to BYU and comes in as a Mormon. Brigham Young University welcomes students of all religious convictions and those of no conviction at all. But what happens if you enter as a Mormon student and in the course of your studies, as happens in, to so many college students, those convictions change. And I was really pleased to hear of the care with which young people are treated, if in fact this happens to them. I was pleased to hear that they are assisted in a variety of ways, and to know that even though some of these young people feel that their religious freedom is restricted because there are consequences, very serious consequences, that may be triggered if in fact uh, young people change their religious convictions, that they're treated with respect, that they're helped and supported, and that some of these young people have actually taken these uh, concerns even to the courts, and that they've been adjudicated, and that the position that BYU takes has been upheld by the courts and has been approved by accrediting agencies. So I'm, I'm grateful that they took the time to share all of that with me. Why is that relevant to what religious freedom means to me? It's because this, this issue was brought to my attention by a young person who had been a student here at BYU. And for me, then, it becomes an issue of conscience. It becomes an issue of raising, of using my voice, of using my life, of using everything about myself in the service of God standing up for what is right in every setting. It's not enough to do it as I pray in the morning, as I do my private devotions. It's not enough for me to do it in my church, but it's something that has to be raised in every venue. I have to be faithful in every setting. So on one occasion, I had the honor to speak at the Vatican, and there I was speaking on the complementarity of of male and female, and I could not, in good conscience, speak at the Vatican without speaking about the terrible sex abuse scandal that has plagued the Catholic Church. I was, I don't want to tell you that I didn't do it with fear and trembling. I did, fear and trembling. But that, to me, is what religious freedom is. It is acting on our deepest convictions regardless of the price. And so I am grateful today to talk to you just a little bit more because the importance of religious freedom being available in the public square has really shaped my life. I want to do what um, the elder who spoke yesterday did not do, and that is quote some scripture and read to you from Matthew 25, 31 to 40. Amen. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. For me, religious freedom is about service to the poor. It has been a tradition in the black church. It was the fuel of the civil rights movement. It was black churches that organized and took to the streets. It was black preachers who led but more importantly, the shock troops, the thousands of people who were out there in their Sunday best, being attacked by police dogs, facing fire hoses and police truncheons, 
those were Christians. Those were people of faith. Those were Jews who came down from the Northeast. Those were, some people were atheists, acting though on many on religious conviction and led by the black church, transforming the lives of black people in the South. But it's not just what happened in the civil rights movement. Today, black congregations in the city of Philadelphia contribute over $240 million each year in volunteer services in their communities, according to Professor Stephanie Boddy's research. And that's just Philadelphia. It's happening all across the country. And black churches, those congregations that she studied, both Christian, Muslim, of any kind of faith, we are the smallest, typically, and the poorest congregations. Yet we serve the neediest, and we're more likely to have a social justice program than other congregations. That is religious freedom at work. That's the power of our faith being enacted in the public square. We provide education for the very young. We provide food for the hungry. We provide housing for the elderly. And you heard it referred to briefly in our own church, a tiny church, a handful of people. We were a part of launching the Boston Ten Point Coalition. Those churches, those uh, organizations, those faith-based organizations came together to work with the police in Boston and to turn around an enormous crime wave so that for 27 months there was not one single youth homicide in Boston. It was a costly endeavor for my husband, for me, because we lived in the middle of it. Again, exercising that religious freedom, as we graduated from Harvard, we moved into a poor black neighborhood in Boston, not realizing how violent the neighborhood was. But my husband, and I'm sure he will share some of this when he speaks, had in fact been drafted into a gang before he was rescued by the black church in Philadelphia. He ministered to those young men. The leading drug dealer came to call him Papa Gino. He built relationships with them. We developed a community center, the Ella J. Baker House, where we ministered to thousands of kids, helping to turn their lives around having educational programs, job training programs, recreational programs, being on call for them 24 hours a day. I remember one night coming home from watch night service at 2 a.m. on the 1st of January, I don't remember what year, and there's somebody pounding on the door to get my husband because the police had pulled over some young men and were harassing them. On call 24 hours a day. That is religious freedom at work. I want to make sure that I don't steal my husband's time, but I'll just tell you of one other really important thing that came out of that tiny church. The Ten Point Coalition, <laughs> the Ten Point Coalition went national, but we even had an international impact. Uh, it was mentioned that my husband has spoken in Zimbabwe, and this was in uh, 1998. No, yeah, 1998, just as the AIDS epidemic was really. Uh, decimating the African continent. And he found out about this and came back and this t out of this tiny fellowship came a movement that led to a front page story in the, uh, in the Newsweek about AIDS in Africa. Out of it came a award-winning series in the Globe, a extensive seven-day series on AIDS in Africa. Out of it came Save Africa's Children, an organization that m provided for the needs of AIDS orphans in Africa over a period of over a decade. That is religious freedom at work. But there's another aspect to religious freedom that I want to share, and that is the right to share our faith. We cannot be faithful to our beliefs when we are told, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's not enough for us to put our lives on the line serving the poor. 
We need to share the most precious thing we have, which is the gospel. We need to be free to do that in a respectful way and in accordance to the laws of the land, but we need to be free to do that. So I, it was mentioned that I lecture at Harvard and last fall, a young freshman comes to me and she wants, she has all of these questions about the church. What does faith mean? Uh, why do we do the things we do? What does this Bible passage mean? Or in many cases, uh, she didn't quite have the Bible passage right. So I spent hours, you know, just talking to her, just sharing my faith, just grateful for the opportunity to pour out into her everything that I believed and that had been revealed to me over many years of serving as a Christian. What she did with that, I don't know. I don't compel. I just want the freedom to be able to share. And she makes a decision about what happens next. But whatever the laws of the land, I'm reminded of what Peter and John did when they healed a lame man and the Sanhedrin called them to account. And it says in Acts 4, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So I think ultimately religious freedom is about obeying God. And if the laws of the land are contrary to God's laws, respectfully, lovingly, we must obey God. Thank you for taking time to listen to me. Can you say amen? amen? I know this is an LDS crowd, and you all are a pretty mellow group. <laughs> so I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> um, I want to sort of underscore what Dr. Rivers has said and extend um, my heartfelt thanks to uh, the LDS for convening uh, this brilliant forum, and I shall attempt to stay to my time all right, and be concise, which as a black preacher constitutes a miracle. <laughs> all right. um, but I simply want to sort of add some additional footnotes to what Dr. Rivers has said because uh, she has outlined uh, the basic contours of what this means, religious freedom for black people. And I want to do a couple of things very quickly for you uh, so that you have an understanding that for black America, for the descendants of slaves who still have in their history a knowledge of how God delivered us as he delivered the Israelites, Religion is a much deeper thing than for any other group in the United States. Uh, the Pew Research Forum did a, an analysis of religion in America, and they said, listen, hands down, you know, black people may not have a lot of money, they may not be in the Fortune 500, but they got more religion than anybody. Faith for us is a matter of love, it's a matter of truth, it's a matter of justice and forgiveness, and it's a matter of life and death. For black people, as slaves, it was our faith in God that gave us the conceptual and cognitive things we needed to believe that in the face of unbelievable adversity, God could deliver us. You see, and so it's in the crucible of extraordinary, unparalleled suffering, in the crucible of black families that were torn apart, where uh, fathers were separated from mothers, and the identity 
the identities of black people were being destroyed. It was in the crucible of those events over hundreds of years that we learned about God. God delivered us, and that is the basis of our identity. And so the book, the book is not simply a religious. See, see, white people are interesting, right? Since you compartmentalize your life, you can have religion over here, your money over here, and religion in a little small corner. Your money and your, and, your, and your material things for black people, the absence of those other resources meant that God was the center of our existence. As a young Christian, I came to Jesus Christ as a result of my life being threatened by 12 boys who had committed to kill me. And I got converted on a Sunday night when Billy Graham, not quite my dude, my demographic, right, preached a message on, of salvation. And I got on my knees as I looked out of my front window with these dudes in the street who wanted to kill me. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. From that, having been drafted into a street gang when I was 12, I was brought off the streets and my life was transformed. This was not simply religious ideology. This was not simply I was too ignorant to do anything else, so I embraced God. There was a life-transforming experience that took me from the streets of Philadelphia to Emerson Hall in the philosophy department at Harvard, where I majored in philosophy and the history of science. And in fact, I went to Harvard to study philosophy and history of science because that was the most atheistic you know, department in the humanities, and I wanted to philosophically and intellectually engage. So while I'm giving you my little black testimony, there's an intellectual and philosophic component to this. For black people and the black church, the Bible is the book. When we read Genesis 1:27. And God created a male and female. That's not just religious dogma. Now, some of you folks that are sort of theologically illiterate and, and sort of snooty and think you're more important than you are, you might dismiss that. Somebody say amen, right? But for the believer, Genesis 127 is a philosophical, anthropological assertion about the nature of the complementarity of men and women. It is on the basis of that that we organize our reality. And then Jesus in the Gospels reaffirms that anthropological affirmation. And so we stand on that. The Bible for us will be the word of God. And because unlike other people, our lives, the, 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 the success, as my wife said, and, and, and just an additional point that she omitted from her presentation. I'm going to wrap this thing up. She didn't point out, and I thank God for my wife every day. In 1991, as we, as a function of faith, went from Harvard to the most violent neighborhood in Dorchester, let me say to you, all of the high liberals who sit high and look low and patronize and condescend to the regular Americans, they didn't show. What happened is that people of faith who, based on their religious conviction, were given the courage so uh, upper middle class Jamaican woman who had graduated from Harvard, her junior year Phi Beta Kappa Magna, Summa, excuse me, Summa, was so motivated by her faith that she committed her life to the poor. And when our house was shot in the first time, serving the poor, and they shot 29 times, the next day, the press said, well, Reverend Rivers, you're going to leave. They shot at your house, and the first three bullets went close to our firstborn's head. My wife said, as a function of the power of faith, how could we leave these children who cannot leave this poor neighborhood and go? Were we saying that our child's life was more important than theirs? That was so moving as an expression of faith and commitment to the poor that the police officers cried. They were so moved by this concrete expression of faith where faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen, and we mobilize sacred institutions to serve secular purposes. For that reason, we will stand by what we believe. For that reason, we will affirm, especially for the poor, that there must be a coherent definition of family that does not need to be fluidity and confusion among the poor. They need clear teaching which will empower them 
to be successful. So I'm going to wrap this thing up. I thank God for the opportunity to share. And I pray that you will pray for us so that as we go into these inner cities in the most violent neighborhoods, humbly with our faith, that we can support one another as we have the courage of our convictions and don't compromise the most important elements of our faith to be invited to the party. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Thank you very much.